Hello everyone! In this video I will be talking about the IBM PC-DOS sound card history and emulation, and how that relates to the Isles of Terra sound setup. So, right now what you're looking at is the Might and Magic 3 configuration utility, and this is the sound cards that the game supports. That's quite a lot! So in order to understand why it supports that many and what the difference is, you have to delve a bit into the history of the IBM PC and its sound cards. So on this list you can see the PC speaker, poorly named, but uh, it was the very first thing that could actually output any kind of sound to begin with on the uh, PC. It was not meant to be a audio device at all. In fact, it's a debugging device. The only reason why it exists is so that it could beep on boot. If it beeps weirdly, or it doesn't beep, or it beeps once booted, that means something is wrong, and you have to check your PC. Otherwise, it was not supposed to be used ever, but it was a sort of music device. Um, at the time when the IBM PC was new, there were no other sound cards, and uh, people who were making games for the IBM PC, they had to do with what they had, and that was only the PC speaker. Um, so, the PC speaker itself is kind of like a square wave generator, as in, it can beep, it can boop, it can change the tone of the beeps, and that's all it can do. It cannot uh, do polyphony, it cannot do anything else than just a beep of s different tones, so it's not much of an audio device. However, some uh, managed to figure out how to do something resembling a tune with it. Uh, that's how the intro of Might and Magic 2 Gates to Another World was made. And, well, it was quite abusing the PC speaker, but there were no other better options. There were a few things on the IBM PC back then, but they were meant not for games, but rather for professional musicians and such, and they were very expensive. The probably first real sound card that is worth mentioning is the so-called Game Blaster, or the Creative Music System, by Creative Technology. It was an early sound card, uh, they used a Philips chip to drive it, and the Philips chip itself was actually also a square of wave generator. It did have 12 voices, which was quite a lot for the time, but since it was a square wave generator, it still all that it could do was beep and boop. It couldn't do anything more uh, advanced than that. So essentially, it was the equivalent of having 12 PC speakers strung together. You can get something out of that, but not particularly nice sounding anyway. And it also was quite expensive. I think it was around $100. So, yeah. Many people would still simply stay with the PC speaker, which was built in into pretty much every PC back then. And then, after the Game Blaster, came the Adlib, as you can see on this list, it's right there. The Adlib was first sound card that was actually fairly good at what it was supposed to be doing. Uh, Adlib chose the Yamaha OPL2 chip that had a frequency modulation synthesizer. Now, how a frequency modulation synthesizer works is that it has a few waveforms that it offers, like a sine wave, a half sine wave, uh, 
a uh, double wave or double sine wave with a half in both and uh, basically how you get sound from that is you combine all these different wave types uh, do all kinds of math operations on them and you get a new sort of wave that actually has some similar sound to an actual instrument. It's not very easy to do as you can probably imagine but at least it was something and you can get some sound that is similar to a real instrument. Not very similar but at least better than just a simple beep. The adlib was interesting in that it was created originally by a group of researchers unlike creative technology who were always um, about gaming and games. The adlib was not that initially, but once it was made into an actual sound card, it was targeted at games. However, it didn't have much of a marketing, and it was ignored for a while, but then eventually people realized that, hey, this is actually pretty good hardware as far as that goes. Maybe we should actually start using that. And thus, the adlib became dominating in the market. Now, speaking about DOSBox, um, if you look at the options here, the DOSBox can emulate the PC speaker. And you can, of course, turn it off if you want to. I'm not sure why you would, though. It can also emulate other things, but it cannot actually emulate the AdLib. And there is a good reason for that. And it also comes down to the history. So AdLib was dominating for a while. But, let's go back to creative technology. They came up with a very interesting plan. They bought one of the AdLib cards, looked at what was written on it, and found out that the AdLib used the Yamaha OPL2 synthesizer. So what they did, they came up with a new sound card that they called Sound Blaster. It had a lot going on it. First, it still had that old Philips square wave generator thing from the Game Blaster. Then it also had the Yamaha OPL2, which is a very interesting thing already. That means that the Sound Blaster could play back correctly everything that the Game Blaster could and everything that the AdLib could. So that's already quite a bit of a value. In addition, they also added a game port to the sound card. And to that you could connect things like uh, a joystick and such. Earlier you had to buy an additional card just to connect your joystick. And here it would save a lot of space. And the killer feature of it was that it also had a digital sound processor. That was a very early uh, version of wave sound that we have these days. It used PCM, which is Pulse Code Modulation, and it was, like I said, like current wave audio files. Very similar to that, and that allowed games to ship their own sound bits and play them back whenever they were needed. Which is a very interesting thing, because when you have just frequency modulation synthesis, you have to play around with the wave things, and you cannot get anything very accurately. Well, not without spending extremely long time on playing around with it. So things like speech is pretty much impossible to do with just frequency modulation synth synthesis. And it's quite easy to do with uh, pulse code modulation, because you just record it and then put it on a file. Very useful. So Sound Blaster could do all of those things 
So it was very amazing. It didn't even cost that much more than the AdLib, because they used uh, hardware off the shelf and such. So the Sound Blaster sold very well, and it basically rendered the AdLib obsolete, because why would anyone go for an AdLib instead of a Sound Blaster that can do absolutely the same thing that the AdLib can, except more, and doesn't cost much more. And that was the beginning of the fall of AdLib. It would eventually go bankrupt. Solely thanks to creative technology. <laughs> um, a bit later, creative technology also introduced the Sound Blaster 2.0, which had some improvements to the DSP chip. In, s in fact, it replaced the Philips chip with a better DSP chip. And interestingly enough, there was also a Sound Blaster 1.5, which had everything that the Sound Blaster 1.0 had, except for the Philips chips themselves, but it did have uh, two sockets to put them in. You could either put the Philips chips, or you could add the new DSP chips. And so with one configuration you could play the old Game Blaster games, and with the other configuration you could play uh, the newer games with a bit better quality. So that was a very interesting choice, having modular sound cards like that. Now, uh, talking about the Sound Blaster 1.0 and 2.0, DOSBox can emulate that too. It can emulate the Game Blaster, it can emulate the Sound Blaster 1 and Sound Blaster 2. Also, you can choose, say, Sound Blaster 16 and then choose the OPL mode. CMS is whatever the Game Blaster had. OPL 2 was what Sound Blaster 1.0 and AdLib had. Dual OPL 2, I will talk about it a bit later. Um, basically, <clears throat> the uh, AdLib is not emulated by DOSBox exactly because there is no reason to. The Sound Blaster OPL2 is exactly the same chip as the AdLib did. So in fact, if you were to select the AdLib, it would simply fall back to the Sound Blaster. Since, well, there is really no difference. Then, there was not only Creative and AdLib in that field, but in a slightly different field, but still uh, related to sound on the PC, was the Roland Corporation. They actually focused more on the professional musicians, performers, and such. They created things like music keyboards, but also synthesizers. Interestingly enough, they were the ones who also spearheaded the MIDI standard. Of course, that was already after 1991 when Might Magic 3 Hours of Terra came out. Um, interestingly enough about how Roland equipment and later on the MIDI specification worked, is that instead of how the FM synthesis worked earlier, MIDI was sheet music. So you could simply uh, use any sort of uh, uh, keyboard for music and simply input the music with it, and it would get recorded into a MIDI file and played back everywhere else. You didn't have to juggle any of those wavelets and do any math operations and whatnot. You could just sit in on a keyboard and input the thing and you would be able to play it back at any time. It was very nice for all the musicians who didn't want to learn anything about all the waves and whatnot. Um, so yeah, it was very easy to work with and another interesting thing about all the things that the Roland Corporation did was that it had 
samples. Uh, it was also, I think, based on the same uh, pulse code modulation. So simply recorded samples and so if the musician was to compose something they would say that I want these notes to be played on say drums and then when you play things back on Roland equipment it would play the pre-recorded drums on that channel. So that was very easy to work with and since samples were available like that they were fairly high quality so the sound was way better than when using FM synthesis. So that was very nice and in particular noteworthy is the Roland MT32 device. It was actually an external device that you could connect to an IBM PC by using a MIDI cable uh, basically how that works is that a game which would have support for it and there were some games that did have support exactly for the MT32 it would send MIDI commands into the device through the MIDI cable then the device would process it, uh, turn the signals into actual music composed from all those samples that it had in the internal memory and then it would output the actual sound into either the uh, headphones or speakers that you have connected to the device. The device itself also had an LCD screen showing what it was doing at the time and also a volume knob that you could use to change the audio volume manually. So it was interesting. It was also quite expensive because, like I said, it was more aimed at the professional users and not for simply players at home. I think it cost around $400 and such, so it was really expensive. But like I said, it was easy to work with for musicians and they could afford it, of course, because they had all those uh, studios. and. Uh, so adding support for Roland MT32 and other Roland equipment was quite easy, so many uh, games actually opted to support all that. Especially since the music quality was also quite good. The interesting thing about the MT32 in particular is that for some reason, I haven't managed to figure out what the reason for that was, but it had no way to play piano. It's very weird, because why would you not have a way to play piano? It had drums, it had guitar, it had everything else, but not piano. It's weird. <laughs> so, yeah, so like I said, some games did support the MT32. And since there were some games that were supporting that, and even though Roland wasn't really uh, paying much attention to the games on the IBM PC, they then s noticed that maybe that's actually worth considering. And they released another device that is quite similar to the MT32, called CM32L. It was exactly geared towards game developers and gamers themselves. It had everything that the MT32 had, well, more or less, uh, but it also had additional 33 instrument types. Those instrument types were made for game sound effects. and. Uh, that's why you can hear all things like footstep sounds, like uh, other effects in the game. So that was very nice for games, and some games definitely added support exactly for that model. There was another board released by Roland called LAPCI. This is, by the way, not correct. It should be an I, not a 1. Probably I standing for IBM, 
Um, the LAPCI was actually the same thing as the CM32L, except it was put on an actual sound card instead of an external device. It also meant that it didn't have the LCD screen. It may have had the knob for changing the volume, but it wasn't, of course, very easy to operate it since it's on the back of the uh, PC. But yeah, otherwise these were identical, so if someone is talking about the CM32L, it means that the same stands for the Roland LAPCI. So even though those 33 instrument types for the special effects in games were nice, but Compared to the DSP that the Sound Blaster had, it was a bit limited, because you can only play that back and nothing else. And you cannot do, like, speech, uh, because obviously that's not one of the instrument types, and you cannot really change it enough to simulate actual speech. So that's what the Sound Blaster actually had on Roland hardware. And uh, now, none of the Roland things are actually emulated by DOSBox. There is, again, a reason for that, which I will get to a bit later. So basically, all of what I was talking about here is exactly what was around the time of my Magic 3 development and release. Since the development team of my Magic 3 wanted to use um, the features from both the Sound Blaster DSP and also wanted to have a nice time and good quality from Roland equipment, they added support for both. And here you can see the Roland and Blaster option. What it does, it works pretty much exactly the same as simply selecting Roland LAPCI except for the bits that need actual DSP, in which case the built-in, well, the added Sound Blaster card would be used for that instead. It was not used for all the other things. Music would go from Roland, sound effects would go from Roland. Only the bits like the Shelton speech would come from the Sound Blaster. It's a bit unfortunate, because it would be nice if they would have added the ability to mix and match the two. But, unfortunately, that was not the case. Um, so... The time of the release of Modern Magic 3 was 1991. And it was a fairly unfortunate time, because it was just barely early. Just a bit after that, standards became a thing. In 1991, the general MIDI standard that was based on the MT32 from Roland was released. And that was very important. Also, it was based on the MT32 and not the CM32L, which means that all the extra things for games did not actually make it into the standard which will have a bit of a repercussion later. The general MIDI standard also extended what the MT32 could do. The first thing they actually did was add piano support, which is also very interesting, and I will talk a bit about that later. Um, the general MIDI standard did not include any actual samples as part of the spec, and that also had some repercussions later on, both good ones and bad ones. So the general mid standard was implemented by DOSBox, and by implemented I mean implemented and not emulated. It's also called MPU-401. Uh, how this actually works is that the game sends MIDI commands 
uh, into DOSBox, since DOSBox is the one that runs the game. Then DOSBox simply passes all those commands into the native operating system. And then whatever the native operating system has is what is used for the MIDI. If it doesn't have anything, then you will not hear anything at all. DOSBox itself does not also include any of MIDI samples. So you have to have something extra in order to play them back. You could have an actual sound card or you can have a software synthesizer that works as a virtual sound card. It's really up to you. But yeah, before talking about how to set things up, I want to uh, talk a bit about later history that was after the release of Mighty Magic 3, which is also still quite important to know how things are set up at the moment. So, uh, around 1991, it might be 1992, I don't remember uh, right now. Uh, Creative actually released something they called the Sound Blaster Pro. It was interesting in that instead of having just one OPL2 chip, like the Sound Blasters 1 and 2, it had two of them. And that allowed the Sound Blaster Pro to output, uh, instead of mono, they could output stereo sound, which was interesting. So the Sound Blaster Pro is also emulated by DOSBox. If you look at this, um, there's Sound Blaster Pro 1, Sound Blaster Pro 2. And also in OPL mode, there is dual, dual OPL 2. It's kind of a hack though, like the dual, dual OPL 2 was in and of itself not ideal, because obviously you want the whole chip to be stereo uh, capable and not just have two chips doing that, but uh, it worked at the time. So, going back to AdLib, even though Sound Blaster 1.0 pretty much ate their entire user base, they still had a bit of resources and they wanted to go back into the scene and they thought the best way to do that would be to innovate once again. And so one thing that they thought up and later on actually created and released was called AdLib Gold 1000. A very important update in the AdLib Gold was that it used, instead of the Yamaha OPL2 chip, used the Yamaha OPL3 chip. It was very interesting in that it had backwards compatibility with OPL2, so anything that was written for OPL2 could be played back on the OPL3 without any issues. It also improved things by having even more waveforms, up to 8, so it's twice as many. And another interesting thing that was in AdLib Gold that maybe they also took from a Sound Blaster is that it had some extensibility support. One of the things that was able to be connected to the AdLib Gold was a surround sound module. That was quite unique, but alone it wasn't actually enough to save AdLib. They also planned to have more modules, such as a modem module and a SCSI module, kind of like back when Creative made the Sound Blaster 1.0. Um, kind of like that, in order to save some of the slots for end users. And unfortunately for AdLib, they used some in-house components, the card itself ended up being quite big and quite expensive. And even though it was quite advanced for uh, frequency modulation synthesizers, it's uh, 
uh, wasn't very popular. And again, that can be due to creative. What creative did is they once again bought an Adlib Goal 1000 and looked at what kind of a chip it had. They figured out that it was the Yamaha OPL3 and they ordered a bunch of those. So they took their Sound Blaster Pro and they simply switched out the OPL2 chip with the OPL3 chip. And also they managed to make the board a bit more compact, smaller, and a bit less expensive. So basically, <laughs> the Sound Blaster Pro 2 could play everything that the AdLib, the AdLib Gold, the Sound Blaster, and um, well, have all the backwards compatibility in it. So once again, there was absolutely no reason to buy the AdLib Gold instead of the Sound Blaster Pro 2. <laughs> so once again, Creative completely ate all the uh, market share that AdLib would have got otherwise. <laughs> it's quite amazing how they managed to pull that off twice. And that was pretty much the last nail in AdLib's coffin. And if that wasn't it, then the next thing that Creative came up with, the Sound Blaster 16, definitely was. So the Sound Blaster 16 had improvements in, well, pretty much every place that there could be improvements in. So one thing that the Sound Blaster 16 had was better DSP and even more so. Uh, it was already fairly okay, as you could have heard, but it still needed some improvements, and so Sound Blaster 16 delivered that. Then the Sound Blaster 16 also implemented the general MIDI standard that I was talking about earlier. And interestingly enough, that was actually done by something they called Wave Blaster, and it was a bit like AdLib's idea to make an extensible sound card. So the Wave Blaster was a connector that connected the Sound Blaster 16 to a something called a daughter board, basically an add-on card. Uh, different manufacturers could make add-on cards for the Sound Blaster 16, and they definitely did, including Roland themselves. So the Sound Blaster 16 sold like hotcakes. It was definitely the most popular card at the time, and it would continue to be absolutely popular quite a few years after that. So since that was pretty much the ultimate de facto standard, uh, paired with a daughter board from Roland called the Roland Sound Canvas, very many games supported exactly that, and well, it was quite the standard back then. So, like I said, it's quite unfortunate that My Magic 3 was released in 1991 before there was general MIDI and before there was the Sound Blaster 16. And, well, about the history after that, um, there was another company, Gravis, who came up with a sound card called Gravis Ultrasound. That was an interesting card in that it also implemented the general MIDI standard, but with a very interesting new spin. Users could actually load their own um, their own patch files which contained the samples for all the MIDI instruments uh, in the MIDI standard and uh, by doing that they could actually change how they could listen to MIDI. All the previous implementations of General MIDI were static, as in you buy the sound card and it has a certain sound. Starting from Gravis Ultrasound, that was no longer that. You could change the uh, loaded samples on the fly and 
you could even have different sound files for different games, which was very nice. And that was all thanks to the MIDI standard not actually standardizing any of the samples. Um, another interesting thing at the time was that creative, being creative, did everything once again. They bought a Gravis Ultrasound sound card, looked at how it worked, and thought, hey, well, these patches are very interesting as far as concepts go. How about we implement that into our Sound Blaster? <laughs> uh, once again. And they came up with another thing that they called Sound Font. It was similar to patches in that you could load it up and change all of the instruments, but like the patches, the sound fonts actually were the entire set of, uh, of samples that were defined by the general MIDI standard in one file only. So it was like a bundle of all of those patches in put into one file. So it simplified things a bit. And then Creative released the Sound Blaster AW32 with sound font support. And then everything else is fairly recent history, so I will not go further than that. Alright, so now let's talk about how to best set up DOSBox to get correct sound in DOS games. Uh, and in, of course, Might and Magic 3, Isles of Terror in particular. Uh, so, as I was talking about the two different standards that were back in the day, there was FM synthesis and there was the general MIDI, or simply Roland's equipment, um, those are very s different paradigms. If you have FM synthesis, then since it works by combining and doing maths on the waves themselves, you will always hear the exact same thing whenever you try and reproduce it. Unless, of course, you mess up the waves and you get something completely wrong. But that would be a bug, and not a feature. However, when it comes to MIDI, that was not the case. Um, with MIDI, you could have any sort of uh, samples plugged in, and you would hear things differently. And when the developers of Mind Magic 3 thought about what they should support, um, they came up with the idea of supporting both. Now, at the time, like I said, the Roland equipment was extremely expensive. It cost around $400 per one uh, Roland uh, MT32, I think. So, obviously, not all of the home uh, users could afford that. Very few of them probably could at that point. But like I said, writing actual music for that was very, very easy. And the music quality itself was, of course, much higher than that that they could get from a film synthesis. So the developers decided to add two music subsystems into the game that weren't actually very related to each other and you could activate either one or the other depending on the hardware that was installed into the computer. And that is... Um, that is how you can configure the game. So if you choose the Roland LAPC1 or the Roland and Blaster option, you will get the MIDI sound subsystem if you choose the Sound Blaster option, or AdLib, you will get the FM Synthesis instead. They have their pros and cons, like I said, 
the FM synthesis is quite obvious. It will always sound the same. MIDI will always sound different. So it really depends on how you look at it and what you prefer. When talking about emulation, uh, the DOS box, like I said, it emulates the OPL2 and the OPL3 just fine. It can emulate the Sound Blaster Pro 1, the Sound Blaster Pro 2, the Sound Blaster 16. It has all the OPL modes that you can choose from. Um, if you are running it in the Sound Blaster mode, you want to set the OPL emu option to compat, not too fast, and the default is fast, to get a bit deeper sound effects. So that's one of the things. Of course, you could change it the other way around if you prefer that one, but at least personally I do prefer the compatibility mode and not the fast mode. Um, that's only applicable if you are using the Sound Blaster option, not the Roland options. Alright, so now about how to emulate the Roland parts. Like I said, there is no real emulation that went into DOSBox itself. Instead, it just implements general MIDI. Um, so, like I mentioned, MIDI was based on the MT32 and not on the CM32L, which is kind of unfortunate. So, if you are to play the sound that was made for the CM32L by using something that implements general MIDI in s instead, you will have, instead of all those extra sound effects that the CM32L had, you'll get piano. And so if you just select Roland by default, and you have something that implements a software synthesizer in the operating system, which, for example, on um, Windows you do, there's a Microsoft software synthesizer, you will get piano instead of all those nice sound effects. So when I tried all of that at the first time, I thought Roland was this strange piano uh, sound card. But no, it's actually a bug. Well, a bit of a bug, I guess. It's simply due to the mismatch between the hardware that the game was made for and the later MIDI specifications. So since DOSBox does implement the general MIDI and not anything else, there's no way to actually play CM32L music correctly on DOSBox without special tools. And now let's talk a bit about that. So, as I mentioned now, the samples in MIDI are not part of the spec and they are changeable. And there were cards where you could change it. Uh, talking about the current time, there are two current software synthesizers that are very popular and they both work with DOSBox. Uh, one is Timidity, and the other is Fluid Synth. The Fluid Synth is actually based on the Sound Blaster R32 sound fonts. Setting it up is actually very easy. All you need to do is uh, install Fluid Synth itself, of course, and then download a sound font from internet, feed the sound font to Fluid Synth, and you will automatically get a different sound from DOSBox. That's very easy, very simple to set up. Um, when it comes to Linux, in order to uh, run Fluid Synth itself, you have to do... Um, let me show you that... Here. You have to run Fluid Synth in server mode, or daemon mode. Um, since currently ALSA is the modern thing that Linux uses, you need to use a ALSA, L, server, and that way you will 
and start the fluent south server. You can also add dash i and put the path to a sound font, the one that you want to use. So for example, there is actually a sound font for the OPL3. There's no real reason to use it, because it would simply emulate the same OPL3 that DOSBox can emulate itself as well. But you can do that if you want. Um, so yes, it's fairly easy to set up. Uh, it's probably somewhat similar to that in Windows as well, although I never tried it. But Fluid Synth is cross-platform, so it should work. You can read about it on your own. Then, um, another thing. Um, yeah, the other one that is important is Timidity. Timidity is actually based on Gravis Ultrasound instead. So it uses Gravis patches. Now, it could use sound fonts as well, but from my experience, it doesn't do a very good job at it. It supports them to a certain point, but it doesn't support fancy uh, changes to the uh, samples that are done inside uh, sound fonts, so it's not really good for that. With Timidity, you should instead use Gravis Ultrasound patches, and they can be used directly without any changes. Uh, however, finding the Gravis Ultrasound patches is a bit more difficult than, sounding, than finding sound fonts, um, because they weren't that popular compared to the sound fonts. But when you find some, it's much easier to configure them. Because it's actually hard to edit sound fonts, you need to have external editing tools. When it comes to Timidity, it's actually fairly easy. I can show you one of those things. How one of the... Uh, configuration files looks like. So this is the built-in piano and drums or whatever. So there is simply the bank number. So this is directly from the MIDI spec. So for example, 0 is piano 1, and here is a path to the actual patch, which is a binary file that contains the sample for that. And you can also add all kinds of effects to those patches in order to modify them. You can add some different things. Um, you can change the volume as well, so you could uh, modify it to fit the right music type. So all of that is quite nice. Um, however, the MIDI spec is kind of huge, so actually editing the patches in order to fit your game is possible and you will get very nice sounds, but it will take forever to do that. <laughs> so if, of course, someone wants to do that, that would be great. And you could, in fact, get better sounds than even the original composer could manage to get out of their own equipment, since things are evolving. It's an interesting thing of the MIDI standard, in that even the old things can sound much better since technology evolves. So yeah, um, theoretically, the whole thing with sound fonts and the Gravis patches, it could work to implement the CM32L instruments instead of the general MIDI ones, at least in theory. However, in practice I haven't uh, found a single one of that, neither in Gravis Ultrasound uh, configuration nor in sound fonts. I'm not saying that there are none, maybe there are, but I haven't found them. If you manage to find some of that, 
then it would be nice if you could tell me because that is very interesting and if there is a way to actually get CM32L sound through timidity instead then it would be very nice but yeah I don't know any of that um, it is possible to create one's own although it's kind of hard work but you could say capture uh, the individual uh, PCM samples from the Roland equipment and then find something similar in po uh, in terms of gravis patches and then write a configuration file that puts all those uh, new patches instead of all the extra piano ones. So in theory that is possible. However, like I said, I don't know any of that if it still exists. Could be created, but at least now I don't know of any. Um, there is a third way that you could get correct CM32L uh, playback, and that is exactly what I'm using. That is to use another low-level emulator. There is exactly that, made to emulate the MT32 and the CM32L. It's called MUNT, or MT32EMU. Uh, it's the, well, I will put the download links in the description of this video. Uh, it's again cross-platform, so you can run it on Linux and on Windows. How that works is that um, of course, the game itself sends the MIDI data to DOSBox. DOSBox then forwards that to the operating system, which is implemented by MUNT. It takes that and it actually feeds all those raw MIDI commands into the original MT32 or CM32L firmware then it gets the output and then forwards it to the speakers. So that's a very interesting way to get the original sound, because obviously if you have the original firmware actually handling all that conversion from MIDI data into actual sound you can play, then um, then that means that you do absolutely get the original sound. Which, again, is maybe good, maybe bad. I would not say that this CM32L is very perfect for the game itself. Some tracks I actually like the, uh, the Sound Blaster version more than the Roland version. So, being able to change some of that balance would be very nice. That's why I was talking about timidity setup. In theory, timidity can definitely get you a better sound, but you have to put quite a bit of an effort into changing all those configuration files. So, while there is no such option, the emulator, the low-level emulator, is still the best thing, I think, in terms of getting the original sound, the best sound for the game. Um, so, how to use that? The setup is also pretty simple. Um, let me close the install. Uh, blaster. Right, so... Whoop. Ignore that. Um, so if I start MT32 emu QT, that is how it looks like. You can see that it says Alsa MIDI port 128 colon 0. That is very important information. So how to set this up? You first have to download it, install it.
then run it and go to options ROM configuration then you have to also find and put into somewhere the original ROMs from the CM32L or the MT32 or of course the LAPCI also works because it's exactly the same thing as the CM32L just in a different uh, configuration I'm not sure if there are any differences in the control ROMs between them. There could be differences in firmware versions and whatnot. Uh, at the moment I'm using these ROMs. You can see the SHA1 digests here. Uh, so yeah, so you have to put the ROMs into a certain folder, then uh, tell the emulator where you put them and that is it. Then you have everything already set up uh, in terms of the emulator itself, the music emulator. Then in DOSBox you need to go into the audio options and uh, uh, there is this config entry. You have to enter the exact same thing that you have entered here. 1 to 8 colon 0, so enter exactly that, 1 to 8 colon 0. Um, usually that's the default, 1 to 8 colon 0. Um, it is the default for timidity, apparently it's the default for month as well. For fluid synth, I think it accepts anything, so any number here will work. Fluid synth will just take it, so if you enter 1 to 8 colon 0, it will probably work out well, on Linux at least. Now the other options here, um, they aren't very important. The MPU 401 type is not important. Well, you have to have Intelligent or UART. Intelligent is the default, but Intelligent is just additional extensions on top of UART. And I don't think the game actually uses any of that, so it doesn't matter. MIDI device, use the default probably, because uh, that just depends on your operating system. Default on Linux, defaults to ALSA. Alright, so that is how you need to set it up, and everything should then work correctly. Now, another interesting thing that the emulator has, and I will be able to show you that if I start the game, you can see it lights up. Let me rearrange some things. Alright, so I'll just put this on top of everything. You can see the screen. It actually also emulates the LCD screen that would be visible on the CM32L itself, or the MT32, which is very nice. Reportedly, some games actually write some things into it. Um, you can see the numbers, which show exactly what, um, exactly which slot from the MIDI is being played at the moment. Uh, it lists six, and I'm not sure there are more, but yeah, if it's lit, then it means it's being played at the moment. And it also tells you what kind of an instrument is supposed to be playing on that slot. So that's very interesting. It's nice to keep an eye on that. Um, there's also a properties button where you can change things. You don't need to. The defaults are quite good. Uh, I myself have put the delay mode to process immediately. It defaults a bit more on the compatibility side, but this is basically whether or not you want to enable a hack for broken games, and from what I know, Mind Magic 3 is not broken in that regard. The DAC emulation mode is for purists. You can set generation 1 or 2 if you actually had the physical thing and it will emulate that. But high quality is even more perfect than any of that doesn't have all those imperfections. 
And then this is... Uh, you don't really need to mess around with that. I just have it set it like that, because why not? Then you can enable or disable the reverb. I personally like reverb. I have set it enabled and set it to Hall. And you can change the settings, I still have everything on default. And these are for if you want to actually play back some of the MIDI files on the emulator. But otherwise you don't need to touch them. So yes, that is all that you need to do in order to set up correct sound for the game. So that's quite nice. So, in the end... Roland and Blaster option actually gives you the best sound effects and certain music. Not everything, like I said, at least personally. I don't think it's the best for everything. Uh, let's run the setup again to show you all those options. Yeah, so Roland and Blaster are quite good. It uses the MIDI and the sound effects are very nice. The music quality is supreme. Um, if you choose the regular Sound Blaster, you will get more variety in, in some of the sound effects, such as uh, regular clicks. The Roland options will have only a single uh, sound effect, the sort of a starry sound effect that you get. Uh, sound Blaster actually has a choice of three that is played randomly. So it's quite nice in that regard. And at least personally, I feel that some tracks are better on the Sound Blaster. But I don't think that warrants using it over the Roland options. And like I said, theoretically timidity would be the best option if someone was to come up with a nice configuration for that. That would be tailored exactly for Might and Magic 3 Isles of Terra. So that is that. Uh, I will also post some of comparison videos where I will use uh, one for regular Sound Blaster, one for Roland LAPC with Munt, one with Fluid Synth, one with Timidity, or maybe a few with Timidity and Fluid Synth, because you can also change the sound fonts and patches for them. So yeah, so you could compare uh, how all those different options actually sound like. I don't think anything will actually convince me to change from the Munt emulator, though. Unless, of course, you can find some of those patches for Timidity or Fluid Synth. Alright, so that is that. This was a very long video. But I hope you found it useful and an interesting history lesson. And in the next video, I will go over the Might and Magic 3 uh, manual. So I will see you all then. Later.